Alrighty, so I would like to point out first and foremost that I am a giant stupid idiot and I got the Aesop's names wrong. Whoops, I had all that to do and I wasn't even right about it. I'm sorry. So this is what I said and this is their actual names. I got Clover, Elm, and Marrow mixed up. Oops. Oh well, that's what happens when, you know, you have an entire scene to introduce these characters to us and then you don't even introduce their names to us. But whatever, it wasn't entirely my fault, but I did fuck up. This is the correct answer now. So I find it a little weird that only the leaders are in this little like war room meeting with Clover and Crow. I, I, that kind of thing never made sense. Would it not make more sense to have everyone involved so then that you don't need to re-explain it all to them later? I don't know. Here's a fun little mistake thing. If you pay attention to Clover's little like image here, uh, it has the new outfits for the characters. Like Jean has his short hair, you can see, especially when we zoom in, we can see Weiss's hair is now in her braid, which isn't supposed to be accurate because Jean and Ruby aren't in their new outfits during this meeting. Fun little, fun little mistake that I caught. Not sure if anyone else caught that, that's fun. I think this little moment where everyone is uh, looking at their new weapons and hair and stuff, they're trying to figure it out. I think it's a sweet little moment rather than just, and suddenly they have new outfits. I like, Blake looks at her hair, Jean's hair gets in his eyes, and that's what makes him look at it and thinks he should cut it. It's it's little things like that that goes a long way, that go the distance with, with things like an outfit change. Yay! Finally, new outfits! So I know everyone's gonna ask me like what I think about the outfits, and I am in fact- I have a script written about my opinions on the outfits for a separate video, and it's a huge like 10 page long script, so I won't go into it too much detail here because I don't want to be here all day. I don't want to spoil everything I'm gonna say in that one, but short version, uh, I like Ruby and I like Yang's new outfits. I think they're cute. Specifically Ruby's hair is adorable to me. I like Yang's outfit. I know everyone else made fun of her rompers, but I think it's cute. I think Weiss's looks dumb. It looks too frilly and girly and stupid for being in combat. And I hate Blake's. Blake's looks awful. Her head looks gigantic because of her haircut. Or maybe that's just the way they, they modeled her arms. They look too thin. She looks like a lollipop. I hate Blake's outfit. It is disgusting. Ruby and Yang's are nice. Weiss, not a big fan. Uh, Juniper, the more I look at it, the more I like them. Uh, I've always liked John's short hair. I know other people don't like it. I do think the picture that was floating around of their new outfits does a poor job really showing off the outfits themselves. And I think John's hair specifically looks a lot better in motion. So that's my general rundown. <laughs> so it doesn't look like John got like lasers in his sword like I was hoping. Bummer. But he did like also get like gravity dust in the arcs on his shield. So now he can like push things away. I think that's really cool. That's actually incredibly smart. Oh, Crow, look at you. This is like the first like good look at his outfit that we got and uh, I like it a lot. It's nifty. You look, you're looking nice over there, Crow. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to count this little interaction between Yang and Blake as figure out Bumblebee because they haven't figured anything out yet. They're still just like doing vague flirting. I, are they dating or not? I, that's the thing I want to know and based on how we're heading, it looks like I'm not going to get a, a, an actual solid answer this volume. Oh well. I do like that they do confront Ruby on lying to Ironwood, and, and I like that they, they weren't all really on board, and I like that Ruby's also very conflicted with her own her own actions back there. She, she, her immediate answer is, we are, as if we're doing it right now, but you can- I, I can tell she's conflicted about this decision that she's made, and I'm glad that we did actually address it. Specifically, I do really like Oscar's, he, he, he mimed, he spoke what I made a joke out of. Yes, they're doing the same thing that Ozpin did to them. And I'm glad someone actually pointed it out. That's really cool. Uh, probably shouldn't keep running around with an ancient relic on a keychain. I want Rooster Teeth to now have little mini keychains of the Relic of Knowledge. I think that I would buy that if it was reasonably priced, but it's Rooster Teeth so it won't be. <laughs> So this episode is legitimately funny, and I want to take a moment, it's going to be, <laughs> this is going to be a big old tangent, so strap on in. I want to take a moment to explain why the comedy in this episode worked, but the comedy last time didn't, because there, there is a nuance to comedy that people don't understand. So let me, let me dive right in. First of all, the first thing that you need to keep in mind is comedy is an extremely, extremely subjective. Something that'll make me laugh won't make someone else laugh, and vice versa. You can't make everyone laugh, not everyone's gonna find this funny. I found this episode honestly funny. 
But I'm sure a bunch of people out there didn't and found the last episode honestly funny. It's entirely subjective. That is the first thing to keep in mind. This episode worked comedy-wise because they set it up, because it's entirely set up. A punchline lands because of the setup, and that's the same thing using your visual medium to your advantage. Last time, their jokes relied entirely on slapstick stretch comedy, and there's no, it, there's no joke at the end other than the visuals looking different, which usually doesn't make me laugh, and for Ruby, nowadays, doesn't fit the show. Ruby is now a serious show that involves death, involves very hard decisions based on her characters, lying, it, there, there's dismemberment. Ruby is a serious show, and having goofy stretch comedy like that is usually a better fit for much more lighthearted, kid-friendly kind of antics. Volumes 1 through 3, it would work because those were very tonally different, but here we are, 7th volume, after everything we've seen up till then, those kind of jokes don't fit in the tone of the show anymore. Having clever wordplay jokes like this episode usually works a lot better. Next, the setting around the jokes worked better in this one. We, the, the kids make jokes, obviously, because and they only do that before they encounter any monsters. While they're landing and they're talking to the Aesops and they're talking to each other, that's the time they're making their jokes. Last time, we just had this big, very serious conversation with General Ironwood that could change the entire world. It goes against everything that they've been fighting for up till now and could potentially cause the deaths of thousands. And then they immediately just start firing a bunch of jokes at us it doesn't it it doesn't fit that it, we're doing tonal whiplash at that point in time now not not to mention all of our jokes also happened during scenes where we're supposed to be introduced to very important serious characters the drunk guy on the ship forest i think was his name he's telling us about a rebel leader and they're peppering just goofy boingy sound effects throughout that doesn't tonally fit same with the Aesops, we're trying to introduce these characters, but rather than actually introduce them to us, they're prioritizing their comedy. That isn't a good time for comedy. In this episode, they only do it before they find any monsters, and after they find the monsters. The moment- uh, they have their three separate teams. The moment a team sees the enemy, they stop making jokes. Unless, it, of course, it fits with a character's specific personality. Yang is a very light-hearted, upbeat person. It makes sense she would have a bit more jocular dialogue even during the encounter. It makes sense because she has done that before and it fits with her person. Same with Mero, seems to be sassy and comedic and Harriet's interactions with him are the same way, but they don't do it during combat. Last time, why spinning Ruby around like that didn't make sense because it, why, why was Weiss the one who did that? Yes, Weiss is Ruby's best friend, but She's in a, her hometown that she hates. She hasn't wanted to be here this entire time. She just heard all this really important news from Ironwood, and she has finally interacted with her sister for the first time in years, and they delegate her to slapstick comedy. It didn't fit with what Weiss is currently going through, and it didn't make sense. Lastly, they delegate the comedy specifically to Juniper's team. Because the other teams are dealing with much more serious- we, we were told this right from the beginning. When Team Ruby lands, and when Crow and Clover go into their caverns, the setting is much darker. Their caves are very dark, dimly lit. Team Ruby lands, and they're surrounded by dark infrastructure, destroyed mines and things. It, it's immediately a very oppressive tone that we're walking into. Meanwhile, Juniper's team has been much more lighthearted, and they execute the most jokes out of everyone. It's, it makes sense if you're delegating comedy to a comic relief kind of team or moment or character. Not everyone needs to be doing jokes all the time. That's the point. And we're told Juniper is the comic relief because we initiate their part of this encounter with Elm telling a joke. She's very lighthearted, she's fun, and then, while descending, Jean's landing is clearly much clumsier than everyone else's. Subconsciously, it should go in your mind that this is the comedy group, because they've made you laugh, and then once they go into their minds, it is the only one that is fully illuminated and brightly lit. It is much more uplifting tone around the characters, and so having them say the most jokes out of everyone else doesn't feel out of place mentally, because they've set it up around them 
to be so. So comedy is important, comedy is a subjective, and the way you set up and execute your comedy and who is executing the comedy is very, very important for having it land. That is the big difference between this episode and last episode. I know last time I just complained about the comedy, this time I really wanted to explain what makes comedy good using visual mediums. It took me a second, but I realized Blake reacts to what Harriet's saying, because this is the mine explosion that killed Ilya's parents. It's a nice little touch that they like added that in there and had Blake like realize it. So like Mero's little mini faunus explanation makes no fucking sense. It seems it's kind of like shoved into this episode to like explain something that's probably gonna be important later on. And it's just, it's so jarring and it, 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 it just doesn't fit very well. well. First of all, why would he tell these two characters? They're talking about it and these are the characters that would probably understand it better than anyone else in the party. I don't know, it just felt, it felt heavy handed. It was clunky dialogue. I like how, and this is true for both Ruby and Juniper's teams, I like how the kids are far more proactive with dispatching the smaller enemies rather than the larger geist at the end. They really are just spectators during that end fight. They don't really participate. And I like the uh, difference between like the Aesops are so cautious and careful that they approach every situation very slowly, while Team Ruby approaches it head on and very quick on their feet. Because that's what they had to do up until now. So it makes sense. And I like how they all got to do something. It wasn't just the Aesops run in and like destroy everything and are awesome all the time. I do like the, kid, the fact that the kids did participate and were very helpful, really. I want to point out that uh, last time I said I wasn't a fan of Harriet's voice actress. Uh, it seems just, it was just that one line she kind of mumbles it because she's fine in this episode. Uh, cool, yay. <laughs> Your semblance makes you super fast, just like me. Yay, I'm glad they finally say it in the show. So now the comments will finally stop being like, um, actually they retconned Ruby semblance so that she becomes paddles. No, it's always been speed. They just don't animate it quickly. <laughs> I also like how Harriet's speed, like we've had three, maybe four speedsters in the show. I don't know if Neon's counted as speed or just like propulsion, her rainbow thing, but guaranteed three speedsters now with Harriet, and I like how all their speed looks different. Uh, they imply that Ruby's pedal burst probably has more shenanigans with it. Uh, that's fine, whatever. But like, her speed, Ublik's speed, and Harriet's speed, I, they're not just carbon copies of each other. That's pretty cool. My semblance is good fortune. Lucky you, huh? Thursday waiting for love, waiting for love. So this is a fun fight. I uh, I like how it's not just kill the bad guy. There's also the element of make sure none of the dust lands on the ground. It'll agitate and we'll all explode. It's it's fun. It's a fun little showcase of all the Aesops's weapons and semblances. And it's just, it's a fun little encounter. I enjoy the limited nature of the setting rather than how, it, it, they get to play around with it a lot more. You get to see crumbling pieces of the Geist falling everywhere. And we get to see the characters working in tandem with each other. It's a fun fight. So I guess Tyrion's just going around killing people and I don't know why. What, what are you guys planning? What do you benefit from killing drunk forest dude? I do like that they're really playing around with the horror element of Tyrion. He's always been very creepy and playing around with that creepy nature of him. Really, it, it it's fun. It's fun juxtaposition and I'm glad that they're playing around with style, specifically horror, because based on Project Farm in volume six, they tend to do pretty well with horror. So my thoughts on the episode as a whole, it's it, it this was a legitimately just fun episode. This is probably the best episode so far, but to be fair, hasn't had very stiff competition. It is only episode three, but I, just, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it the first time. I had to watch it again to do my audio, and I had to watch it a third time to record the footage for the show, and I enjoyed watching it every single time. It's just a fun, good, well-paced, well-written episode. I like how we showcase all of the Aesops' weapons and semblances without anyone ever holding our hand about it. The only exception being Clover explaining his semblance is good luck, but with a concept as abstract as good or bad luck and stuff like that, that's something that kind of needs to be explained. And as for my bingo board, I am gonna say, actually, I'm gonna cross something off on my list, it's the characters actually talk to each other. And uh, I know this is just the one episode, and I would hope that we continue having good interactions between characters throughout, but I enjoy- if this was the only episode where the characters actually just sit down and be characters with each other, I'm, I enjoyed it. I think about Crow talking to Clover, I think about the kids talking to the Aesops all the way throughout their mission, 
And I think about Team Ruby addressing what happened with Ironwood, about lying to Ironwood. I, I enjoyed the character interactions in this episode a lot. While the action and seeing everyone's semblances and weapons was fun, it was really the characters that made this episode so enjoyable. I know last time I said I wasn't too excited, but that's because this last episode really, really disappointed me in the long run. And I'm honestly excited to say that I want to see more. I can't wait for next Saturday to see what episode 4 brings us. I have high hopes for this volume, and so far it's been a bit of a mixed bag, but if this episode could be so good, I'm hoping there are other really good episodes just like it. So, if you like my content and want to help support me, I do have a Patreon, and I keep bringing up my bingo board. You still have time to submit bingo boards. I want to see them on Twitter. I can, I'll can i link my Twitter in the description, I keep forgetting to do that. I'll go back and link it in other episodes too. Uh, send me your bingo boards through Twitter if you have one, and if you get a bingo throughout the volume, I will give you a special shout out in the Volume 7 review. Any and all thoughts about my review and this episode and the Aesop's? I want to hear them in the comments. Do you think it's a little, like, convenient that Clover's special, his semblance, just happened to be the opposite of Crow's? What did you think of the comedy this time around? Do you agree or disagree with what I was saying? Any and all thoughts, I want to hear them. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.